Hi, my name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesia resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. In this video, we are going to be going on a journey from the neurosurgical operating room that we're standing in right now on the eighth floor of this building, all the way down to the interventional radiology suite, which is in the basement. We're gonna be talking about all of the considerations that go into safely transporting a critically ill patient from one location to another location that happens to be relatively far away. An essential consideration for going on a long journey like this is making sure that we are adequately monitoring the patient's vital signs. So I like to think about it in terms of really just the basics. So you can use a simple mnemonic like the ABCs of a patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. The most rudimentary ways that we have to monitor airway and breathing are simply by taking your hand and putting it over the patient's mouth and feeling for a breath. This is of course not a quantitative way to measure the patient's breathing, but it can qualitatively tell me whether they're able to move air. A rudimentary way to measure a patient's circulation status is simply by taking your fingers and placing them on the patient's carotid artery and seeing if you can feel a pulse. Again, this is not quantitative, but it's at least something. But really, the standard of care for monitoring a critically ill patient is making sure that you have a vital signs monitor, such as this, where I can look at a patient's heart rate, blood pressure, their oxygen saturation, and an EKG continuously throughout this journey. These are the same standards that we would use inside an operating room while observing the American Society of Anesthesiologists standard of care for monitoring. This may seem obvious, but it's important to make sure that your monitors are all functioning correctly before you leave the operating room and to also ensure that you've got an adequate amount of battery for your power supply for the portable monitor that you have. It's not a bad idea to get something like a portable pulse oximeter, which is actually something that I use for basically all of my patients, regardless of how ill they are or how far the journey is that we're going. The other essential consideration that you have to have, particularly when you're going on a journey that involves getting inside of an elevator, is how you're going to manage any type of emergency situation that may arise, and especially the sort of situation where you don't have any sort of additional equipment besides what you brought with you. So for that reason, anytime I'm transporting a critically ill patient, I have airway equipment so that I can manage any kind of airway emergency that might come up. That includes an endotracheal tube, a blade so that I can intubate, and then of course a paralytic agent, for example, succinylcholine. And I may have vasopressors like phenylephrine or an antihypertensive like labetalol but really, the most important tools that I have with me to manage any kind of emergency that might come up are some of the most fundamental tools that we use, which would include an oral airway like this, as well as a self-inflating resuscitation bag like this one that's inside this bag, and vitally, the other piece of equipment that you're gonna need is an oxygen tank like this. And it's critical that you make sure that the oxygen tank is actually full before you leave the operating room because the combination of an oxygen tank, self-inflating resuscitation bag, and an oral airway can absolutely be life-saving tools as you make a long journey like this. And other considerations that arise include making sure you have an adequate number of people who are helping out because as you can imagine, just one anesthesiologist going on a journey like this, it's really difficult to be able to intervene in the event that an emergency came up. The other thing is making sure that you have an appropriate amount of equipment and that may mean calling on the respiratory therapist to get a ventilator if the patient's intubated. And of course, it's really important to make sure that wherever you're going is all set up so that once you get there, you can safely get the patient onto monitors. So speaking of which, we are now in the interventional radiology suite, which for me is like being back in a safe place because as you can see behind me, we have a full setup that includes 
an anesthesia machine, as well as a wide array of medications and equipment that I can use to treat any kind of problems that might arise. As you can see, the journey that we just took is a long time to spend outside of the operating room, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an unsafe thing to do as long as you have the appropriate preparation and know what potential emergencies you may be dealing with along the way. And it's also not the case that all journeys between an operating room and a PACU or an ICU are very long. In fact, it's very common for operating rooms to be immediately outside of the typical destination, for example, an ICU. However, in a very large hospital, and particularly when we're talking about using equipment in the interventional radiology suite, which is often located in a hospital's basement, you may end up taking a relatively long journey, and it's really important to know what you need to have available to safely take care of your patient on that journey. If you found this helpful or interesting, I'd really appreciate it if you liked the video and subscribed to the channel. And you also might want to check out this video where I go through all of the monitors that are used routinely in anesthesiology. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.